I'm chatting with people at the shows, it's always like, wait, the dad was like so important to me, you know, like it was this and that. And it's kind of funny because <laughs> like, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you know, like I, I'm like, I'm like, this is going to sound weird, but you know, it was for me too. Like, Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. This is another episode of this Scoped Exposure podcast. You know, kicking off season three, it wouldn't make sense to have a, a Scoped Exposure podcast season start without some kind of awesome Comeback Kid interview. So I'm really excited to be welcoming Chase of Comeback Kid and Living with Lions on the podcast today. Buddy, thank you so much for joining me. Dude, thanks for having me. Stoked to do it. Absolutely. You know, now we're... Comeback Kid is raising the ranks in the the podcast roster of um, most interviewed band. Um, there's definitely a couple other contenders up there, but you know I think we're this would make it four for five as far as having Jeremy, Stu, and obviously Goose on the show. But um, I think I think this idea kind of sparked um, when Endgame and Comeback Kid played in Calgary together, and you know I have been listening to living with lines as well and saw you guys for dbk five years so many moons ago so i feel like this was just you know a long time coming but i'm uh happy that we're finally making it happen yeah me too i think we're, we're, we're obviously just following in, in goose's footsteps he's he's the, <laughs> the comeback kid podcast master slash interview master so <clears throat> we're just we're just following his lead really you know yeah but i i think something that you know, in my efforts with this podcast is that, you know, for there's obviously going to be certain people in certain bands that are the interview, uh, like superstars per se, like, like goose, but, you know, getting to talk to Stu and, and Jeremy about their different perspectives about their certain roles, uh, has that that's been interesting to me. So when I look at a five piece band, I don't look at just the vocalist as the only person to interview. I always think that there's five different potential episodes for that. So this is just four or five. So <laughs> hopefully that catalog is good. Um, so, uh, Chase, before we get into the music talks, uh, we have to check some bevs. Um, so that's important here on the show. So you were mentioning yours a little bit before we got going. So tell the folks at home what you're going to be sipping on my, my oat milk latte from Prado, a coffee spot in Vancouver. That's pretty good. It's a pretty solid oat milk latte, I will say. And then my, my H2O that obviously I got to have water, yeah. so water you, and coffee, you got two canisters ready to rock. With a pic, with a sticker, my roommate Jado. That's like a portrait that his sister drew of him. We, you'll you'll notice in the comeback kid camp, everybody's got one of those stickers on something. Oh, okay. Yeah. To really, where, do you do you know where those other stickers are residing right now? Uh, Stu probably has one on his pedal board. I'm not sure about the rest of the guys, but yeah, it's just a really like unflattering portrait that he like drew that his sister drew of him. That is. <laughs> It's very coveted. I have the original in my room. Stu actually made up made those stickers. He thought yeah. that he thought it was so funny. I I was like I was gonna say that hairline is just all out of whack. It's coming down like kind of one it's side. It's really funny. He looks like uh, some weird like Transylvanian, I don't know, man or something like that. It's kind of funny. Mm -hmm. Well. Yeah, it, it's funny because it, speaking of stickers, when Jeremy was on the podcast, like a, a hot topic for his was his big vegan sticker on his guitar and how that came to be. Um, so it seems like stickers are a, a common thing within the Comeback Kid camp. Oh, yeah. Jer, Jer and Andrew are really into this. The, I mean, I or sorry, not Jer and Andrew, uh, Stu. Jer and Stu. Stu's the big sticker head. He's, he was mm -hmm. all about it. I just like the funny ones, you know, whenever I can get my <laughs> hand on something funny. Yeah, you yeah. you seem to be like one sticker on one thing, so it's like a selective thing. You know, Very. you're not just gonna go sticker crazy graffiti wall. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm 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 very particular. I just I just bought uh well, I just took Bill's Anki case from him. Bill's like 
who used to play it in uh, another band that we know, but uh, mm-hmm. he, it was heavily it was heavily stickered, and unfortunately, I I had to I had to remove all of them because they just weren't they weren't it wasn't my vibe, man. I'm I'm not I'm not a, I'm not a sticker vibe. <laughs> you're like I can't force this into my life. What's Mm-mm. the um like when you're de stickering something? Do you gotta like goo gone or like what what what's your um your recipe for that? I mean, if I, if I, if I have to, but that luckily those, those just kind of came right off. You know what I mean? I don't want to, I don't want to have to deal with that shit, but if I got to do it, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's always something where it's like, is there something where I'm not like peeling it and it's making more of a mess that I need to deal with. But um, yeah. that's uh that's funny that you're like, Oh, this is too many stickers, bro. I gotta, I gotta chill. This is not my vibe. I gotta chill it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He'll, he um, might be he might be bummed to hear that but i had to do yeah it. sorry bill we yeah. love you big you know friend of the show but you know <laughs> stickers are you know to be decided um so i'm drinking coffee as well um you know it's funny because um you know as 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 far as the time recording this because someone could be listening to this in you know six months or or whatever it is um but it's like fall season so pumpkin spice everything is pumpkin everything is, is the name of the game and my wife made me a, a uh, pumpkin spice latte with oat milk as well. Whoa. Um, but like, yeah. So I was like, damn, I didn't need to give corporate Starbucks any money for something like that. Let's go. So that's been good. And I also have hydration on deck. The sun is crazy right now in my room. Uh-huh. Um, so it's an aha. Big Dude. fan. One so of my favorite good. sparkling water flavors for sure. Peach and honey so good i love the watermelon one too it's so good oh the lime and watermelon one yeah 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 Yeah. what how so what do you guys make your coffee with there at your house so we're pretty bare bones we just do like a pour over kind of like drip um i think as far as like beans there's a place called um last mile that i that i've been kind of experimenting with but like you know there's there's so many good coffee spots here in calgary it's like it's hard to pick a favorite honestly yeah um but yeah like you know before we were recording officially like we were just going off of like um chase was telling me all these good coffee spots in vancouver and i've been to vancouver many a times for work and for band stuff and i thought i knew enough but like your two recommendations, like I have no idea where these are at. So there, there, yeah, must just be a surplus. Kind of off the beaten path a little bit though, too. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but we, but I, those are always the good recommendations because it's like you know, I didn't find this on Instagram. I had to like go through an adventure to find it. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. They're they're really <laughs> yeah. sick, and Buntu is really really good. Yeah. Well, Chase, cheers to you, my friend. Cheers, Excited man. to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. I Ooh, think yeah. we might have the same thermos as well. Kinto? Kinto. Best. Kinto's the move. My girlfriend bought this for me. I actually, I lost it last time we were, we were in Europe in June at festivals, and I lost it. And I was super bummed because she they're not like the cheapest thing ever. And it was like one of the first things she ever bought me. And I was just like, oh, man, she's going to be so pissed at me for losing this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, like a bad omen you know what i mean like but uh i ended up recovering it it was fucking crazy i like got a hold of somebody at the festival and they like they like shipped my mug to our backline company and then when i came back in july it was like with our gear my mug and my actually both of these i lost both of these and i got them back damn except this one hat was so it wasn't even at it wasn't even at a venue was that like a like a festival festival yeah yeah, it was crazy. It was so weird. And then they, the only issue was this one was still filled with like leftover oat milk drink juice. So it was like <laughs> disgusting, you know, like just super moldy and like fucked by the right. time we got back there. But whatever, oh, I got it back. I cleaned the shit out of it. Mm-hmm. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah. Don't go for the swig right away. You're like, oh, is there anything in this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> No, it was. I'm. I'm happy to have it back. It's my favorite favorite mug. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. So Chase, any new guests that I have here on the show, uh, I always like to get a little bit of context about how they kind of got on the path that they're at uh, musically. And so you could either tell your, you know, hardcore origin story, or whether it was through punk or or something kind of in the middle. So kind of like take me way back to the first time you were hearing 
underground music, alternative music, however you want to spin it. And we mm. can kind of get a little bit of a backstory into, you know, getting into the, the stuff that you're currently involved in. Okay. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> for me, it was like, it was kind of a weird path, I guess. Like when I was, I was born in Vancouver <clears throat> and uh, my family, like my parents were really, really close with my auntie and uncle, like my mom's sister and her kids and all that. So we spend a ton of time with my auntie and uncle and my cousins growing up and my cousin, Troy, I mean, I would have been like five or six at this time, but he was super into like punk music and going to shows and like playing in bands. He was a lot older than I was. And uh, he would make me mixtapes and like show me songs all the time. And I was like too young to really get it. But like he, like the mixtapes would have like Nirvana or like Green Day and stuff like that, you know? And this is like old, like older stuff, like Weezer. Um, like really, really old shit. And, uh, and I just kind of, I mean, I liked that. And I guess that was like my, the first time I was ever like really exposed to that kind of music. I mean, there's a lot of like weird, like grunge on there too. And like, I don't know, like alt- definitely more like early, like nineties alternative stuff, but some punk stuff. And then, and then when I was like seven, I moved to Vancouver Island and, and it's, I mean, the town that I lived in was called Comox. It's like, was maybe like 10,000 people or whatever, maybe probably mm-hmm. less when I lived, when I lived there. And I kind of like, they're just, I don't know. There wasn't really like people, a lot of people that listened to like punk music, especially hardcore. Like that, that wasn't even really on anybody's radar. I don't think anybody that I grew up with anyways. So I had those, like that, like reference point from when I was really little with my cousin, but I listened to like all kinds of create like weird shit, like whatever was on much music, essentially. You know what I mean? Like if Cher was playing, I was like down with it, you know, Mm -hmm. just weird, weird shit. My brain was like fried and I was just a really influence, easily influenced like little boy. And uh, yeah. And then I guess as I grew up there, like met people that skateboarded and blah, 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 that kind of thing. And, and kind of fell back into punk music. But for me, like growing up in Comox, again, like there wasn't a lot of people that listened to like punk music or hardcore music. And it was really like more going to like shows that exposed me to like that kind of stuff. The shows were like super small. Like we had a a youth center in Courtney called uh, Connections Youth Center. And that's where like all like the Vancouver bands would come over and play. And these were like, I mean, lesser known bands like, like, and this week with knives. I don't know if you like, if you know who that is or like, the witness protection program like the wpp just like old old like probably early 2000 uh vancouver like like post punk kind of maybe like i don't know post hardcore kind of bands yeah um i, and, I like, think most, so, some of those names are a little foreign to me but i do you know like it i think when i was first getting into local stuff a lot of the i think one of the main vancouver bands that was coming over to play when i was living in winnipeg and growing up there was like fall on archaea that was like one of the big ones oh, yeah, yeah, totally. consistently so, yeah but some so, of those other ones that maybe not had uh broken out like yeah are, like that would have been that would stage. have been like kind of a little bit later on i guess but we sure. like we, this was yeah like and i mean at this time i was probably like you know 14 or whatever and i basically at this point probably to my parents dismay had like decided to just like purely like skateboard and want to play music and, and just quit everything else. And they were just like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You know, they were always right. like, I sh- I'm not going to throw them under the bus. They were always really supportive and they, they were cool with like whatever I wanted to do. But, but that was like, I guess when I was exposed for the first time to like, to like smaller independent, we like artists and like discovering things for myself, you know, not just yeah. like seeing stuff on TV and like buying records and shirts and stuff like that and like listening to them at home and like getting into stuff and really like discovering but again like uh like i said like hardcore was never really like on anybody's radar in in comox where i grew up and i ha- and like i had a friend tyler schwint who i played in a band with who like was kind of the guy that would like find music that you know wasn't coming through on shows and stuff like that and like kind of share it with all of us and Mm-hmm. I remember like the, he was the guy that showed me like misery signals, malice, you know, like that was like the first, very first time I ever heard that record was like him showing me that. So that was like, I guess 
and I, you know, obviously Misery Signals isn't like a hardcore band, like necessarily, like they're kind of in that world, but more like metalcore, but like that. And then for me, like, it's kind of like, it's kind of weird to say and like cheesy and I'm sure Goose and Jer will like cringe at this, but like the very first like hardcore record that I discovered or like listened to for myself was like Wake the Dead, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was just such a weird like gateway album for me because it's melodic and fast and like has a lot of like punkish elements to it, you know? So it was just so easy to like transition into that world off that record and right. then start like looking up bands like, you know, like Bane and stuff. Like obviously they had were around way before, but, you know, kind of like finding other things in that, like in that world and then just dipping your toes into other stuff. And I mean, like, another like you know cheesy weird thing but i'm sure a lot of people my age kind of went through the same stuff it was like Mm -hmm. the very first thing that ever like band that ever made me want to like play music was like blink you know what i mean like that was right and again like that's me just like finding watching shit on like much music and stuff like that but you know that was like what really like opened the door into that world like seeing hearing like dude ranch and then enema of the state it was like i want to do like this is what i want to do you know what i mean i want to like tell we like dumb jokes and like play music i never like i was never really successful with like the dumb joke stuff but but uh and i mean i I was never really successful with the music stuff too because i suck at playing guitar and and bass but but uh that was kind of what opened the door and then yeah going to local shows was like a step further and then yeah and then and then uh discovering i guess yeah comeback kid kind of let open the door into like heavier stuff and then and then starting to play music with my friends and then that turned into touring and then you know kind of i guess flash forward the rest in 20 years and here i am you know yeah but i think you might be the very first guest on the show or people that i even know like to even broaden it a little bit more that like your quote-unquote gateway band was the band that you're playing in like 20 years later that is so wow to me (laughs) dude it's it's so (laughs) it's so cool it's so full circle it it, it's weird because and i and i know like maybe for some like i said like i'm sure it's like kind of cringy for those guys to hear but it's so funny like when we play because i'm like relatively new to the band like i mean it's weird to say i've like already been playing with these guys for almost like six years now Mm -hmm. or maybe yeah but uh, like six years i guess which is insane to think about, but I'm still like a newer, newer member, but it's so funny because we'll finish playing shows, especially like overseas. And I don't think like people really keep track of like who is like new in the band and who is like old, an old member. I mean, they know who Andrew and Jer are and like probably Stu because they've obviously, yeah. but I mean, they've had like a million bass players. So they probably just don't even realize like I'm, they probably think I'm like original. I don't know, whatever. But anyways, <laughs> they, uh, it's always funny because they're like, you know, when we're chat, when I'm chatting with people at the shows, it's always like, wake the dead was like so important to me, you know, like it was this and that. And it's kind of funny. <laughs> like, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you know, like, I, I'm like, I'm like, this is going to sound weird, but you know, it was for me too. You know, like mm-hmm. this, I didn't write that record. I just like, I listened to it, you know? And mm-hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's fucking weird, but it's cool. And, uh, and luckily like for us, like lions was, the definitely like that that kind of bridge to like meet those guys they took us on tour a lot of times and 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 we became really close friends and then and then uh you know and that's kind of how that all worked out but uh but yeah they've always been super fucking cool to us and and yeah man it's 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 weird it's weird how it all worked out but canada's a pretty small music scene and especially when it comes to like hardcore like you know what I mean? It's 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 a it's a small world. It's a really fucking small world here. It's getting yeah. bigger now, but it's it's a fucking small world. Yeah, but I again, I think it's it's really cool of like the full circle nature of being able to have a band that kind of exposes you to that. And then, like you said, obviously, without living with lines, you might have never met those dudes and and be given that opportunity to to be involved in in that project but uh it's it's wild to be like people thanking you for this like record that you're like no i i'm i'm on this side of the fence with you brother like it's all you know it's all good but you know i think the thing that has always you know because um Growing up in Winnipeg, Comeback Kid was the local band that like really helped seal seal the deal for me. And, you know, I've had my own moments of being able to like, 
you know, play shows with you guys and being able to like have you guys on the podcast, like that, that has been really cool for me as like a born and raised Winnipeg person now living in Calgary, but like, I still have like a 204 area, like phone number. Um, but you know, something that has always interested me and like goes to show how, you know, how cool the, the comeback kid machine actually is, is how it's not just like five dudes that live in the same city and you guys get together and jam. It's like, everyone is like spread out so far away uh with vancouver and jeremy and uh winnipeg still and then goose over in toronto so was you joining the band or i guess Stu would have been the original person to help like i guess widen that geographical nature but like when you were joining the band was it already like oh this this is already set up in a way for us to do it quote unquote long distance as a band um, or were there still things to be figured out when you were joining? Uh, I mean, I, I don't, it, it kind of, I mean, it feel like it happened naturally. It's kind of funny. I don't know if they'll be like, like a <laughs> bum that I'm, that I'm bringing this up, but I know like, <clears throat> I know like originally when the discussion was being had, when Ron couldn't be in the band anymore, I, I had filled in, like, I filled in for him a couple times. <laughs> <clears throat> which I don't think was a big deal, you know, but I know like internally when my name had been, sorry, I'm just going to add a notification on there. When my name had been like brought up to like play with the band internally, there was like a little bit of a, of a hesitation because there had been so many like members of living with lions, like that already <laughs> joined that had joined the band, sure. you know? Right. And I think like it, to them, it kind of made sense, you know, like, they knew me, they toured with me, but it was, there was definitely like a degree of hesitation being like, like, we can't do this. Like we can't have another person from this band, like join our band, you know, which I get, I get, but you know, after we did a few tours or whatever, it just, it's kind of funny because, because I think another thing that's really funny about Comeback Kid that they've never really talked about before, but Stu's brought up is like, you don't really ever get told you're in the band you just kind of like eventually are, you know what I mean? Like you fill mm -hmm. in and then eventually it's just like, it's like, am I in or am I not in? And it's just kind of like, I mean, you're in, I guess, you know what I mean? Like nobody really <laughs> like actually like lets you know, it's kind of funny, but, but mm -hmm. yeah, it, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of impressive. Like th for, for them having everything so like, so long distance, like it just, it works pretty easily. Like they, <laughs> a lot of the stuff that we do is like, is a fly in. So like, regardless of where we are, you know what I mean? It, it, uh, it would, it would kind of end up being the same thing. Another really like funny thing about, about, uh, about being so spread out is it like never gives us an opportunity to jam like ever. Like when I first, the very first tour I ever did with comeback kid, we were like, Ron couldn't do it. And I, and I had about a month's notice and they were like, and I'd never actually even played bass in a band before. I've like always played guitar. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they were like, Stu was just like, yo, can you fill in on this tour? Like, can you do this? I was like, yeah, no problem. And I started learning all the songs that I had to play. And it was like, at first so fucking hard. Cause I just had no idea like what the fuck I was doing. And I was like sweating. Like I'm, there's no way I'm going to be able to figure this out in time. Right. But whatever, I got through it. It was fine. I was all good. And we were flying over to Europe. It was it was us and every time I die, knocked loose. And this was like 2017. So like right before knocked loose, like fucking exploded. Right. Exploded. Yeah, yeah. And uh and uh yeah, so we we fly over to Europe and on our way, you know, I'm like, so are we gonna like jam before we before we play a show and Andrew's like yeah totally like we'll get, organize a jam space like we'll get everything set up like we'll we're there a day early like we'll jam with you it's all gonna be good it's like okay cool yeah. and we get there and we're at the hotel and I'm like so like when are we going to the space and Andrew's like oh we don't have our guitars so we, we're just not gonna be able to jam today <laughs> and I was like dude what like no that you, we can't we can't do that like we have to. He was like, they're just like, we'll just <laughs> I need, have to figure I need it. it. <laughs> yeah, for sure, dude. I'm like, you like you guys want to do you want to do this? Like, okay, all right, fine. Let's do it then. We'll see how this goes, you know? Mm -hmm. 
and we like show up at the show and it's like we ran over a few things like during sound check but we didn't have a lot of time so i just like went i went into the first show like absolutely like fucking cold like there was no i i hadn't and it went it ended up kind of go it went pretty good like it went fine but i had never jammed with comeback kid until august of last year it was the very first time i ever jammed with them oh wow that's like coming out of covid <laughs> We had right. we we had one practice, and and you have been in the band in six years. So in the six years, it took five to just have a jam. Pretty much, man. It was fucking <laughs> crazy. Wild. Like I, we just never did it. It was it. You would right. just show up, and maybe like sound check. We would like hit a couple songs that we were unsure about, and then that was mm -hmm. it. Yeah, you know, it was fucking scary, dude. It was the scariest shit for the first like few tours at least, and then. You know, you kind of get used to it after a while, but, but yeah, every, like we, we, we definitely done a lot more since the new record has come out and we've been like kind of learning new songs and stuff like that. We've had a, we've had a few jams here and there, but uh, yeah, it took, it took a long time to like get that first one in. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> it's really crazy. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's really funny. Cause like, as far as the time we're recording this, there was Hold Your Ground Fest in Mississauga that Endgame was playing, and then Northern Alliance that Endgame was also playing. In the first instance, we were flying out with a band also from Calgary that was playing the pre-show, and like we had a we had a layover in Winnipeg. Everything was fine, like when we we're sitting on the tarmac during our layover. But by the time we took off and then landed in Toronto. Um, the other band is getting texts that like their fill-ins were canceling and like we're flying in the day of the show so oh, no. it was like i'm sitting next to the dude being like all right you know gotta figure out a way to help these you know kids figure out their set and it was funny because like as a guitar player they were like well can you learn the riffs and just like the way the like it's like bar chords and it's in standard and i'm always playing in drops so i was like you know I think for me, if I was going to learn this set, I could do it on drums because like a lot of people don't know that I'm like self-taught in drums. Um, you know, I did a podcast a couple weeks ago with Cole from Scal where we just were geeking over the fact that like rock band can actually teach so many people how to play drums versus actual guitar hero because like guitar yeah. hero, you're just on like four buttons, but rock band, you're actually learning the, you know how to rhythm and, and all that. Yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, can the drummer who also knows how to play guitar, thankfully learn this set on guitar and I'll do the drums. And it was like, we like no practice, just like literally just like listening it in the car, like the day of, you know, like an hour before the set, just like, okay, it's into this and then a two step and then this blast beat part. And, uh, and you know, it was all things considered, I think went pretty, pretty well there's no stops but there's a level of stress when you're the first kind of like new kind of thing like you were saying and you're just kind of go like going in real raw dog mode dude for <laughs> sure like, for sure yeah. and you guys pulled it off yeah yeah we pulled it off and like i feel like that was good karma because i was unable to play northern lines that comeback had also played and uh, a really good friend of mine shout out to dave from snake pit was like yeah i can learn the set in three days and fly out and, and rip it and he totally ripped it so i want to shout out him um but it's 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 wild that like people <laughs> in certain situations can be put under those levels of pressure and you know come to and and rise to the occasion to be actually yeah. to make it happen and and you know like I'm sure, like you said, you didn't play that first set with Combat Kid perfectly, but it was good enough to be able to have it where it didn't feel like, oh, fuck, you know? Dude, like, you know what? It was like uh, that. So that first set was pretty good. Like, I, I think it was like pretty spot on. Like, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll just I'll I'd even say I like killed it on that one. <laughs> the, the second set I played with them, though, which was in... <clears throat> which was in uh, like Cologne or something like that in that like area somewhere close to there in Germany was so bad. It was literally my worst fucking nightmare. Fuck up. It like the worst thing that you could ever do. Like second song into the set. Andrew's kind of like within the band is like very well known for like, he likes to kind of, 
call stuff out like audibles like while we're like while we're either right before we go on or like while we're playing he'll just like be like okay we're doing this you know what i mean or like or like this this and just kind of like he'll direct things every so often yeah um so like right and this wasn't really that complicated but like right before we're going on he's like okay i'm gonna start talk is cheap like this i'm gonna like scream talk is cheap and then when i say cheap you come in with the baseline and i'm like okay but it's just one more thing to like think about you know what i mean and i'm already thinking about a million things like okay i gotta in the moment it could easily yeah yeah totally so and tip like leading up to that point like Lauren would just four count me in and i'd start playing or whatever like da 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 na 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 so we're like it gets to that point in the set it's like two songs in and there and the place is like fucking packed it's crazy and uh and so he goes he starts and he's like talk is and i just like panic in my mind i'm like okay i'm like fuck what's the tempo like how fast how fast how fast and it, he's the ghost cheap and i'm just like my and i like completely like blew it like so there was no coming back you know what i mean right. and it was just sheer panic and it just got worse and i just like stopped playing and like <laughs> kind of put my head down and i looked out you could like see out in the crowd people were just like you know and like yeah, everybody's the biggest laugh, fumble like, ever <laughs> Stu is like laughing like andrew's laughing and i'm like fuck and like he like he like comes over and he's like hey everybody like this is our villain bass player you know like <laughs> definitely like letting everybody know you know like that i'm not really yeah, the yeah. guy and i'm like oh, yeah hey. yeah it was dude it was literally like Let's give worst. this another go. Do, 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 do. Yeah, it worst not worst, worst case scenario for sure for yeah. fucking up live. But uh, I, yeah, I yeah. think that was the biggest fear during that set playing drums. I'm like, I just can't stop because mm-hmm. if I stop, it's like, oh fuck. But if if like there was definitely multiple songs where I played like just an extra two measures where everyone's like ringing out and looking at me. I'm like, oh right, <laughs> I have to go into this part now. Yeah. But yeah, the stopping is. I think every parkour person's worst nightmare. That, I mean, that's like the cardinal rule, right? Like you can't do that, but it's a, just a bass intro. Like there was just no way to save it. Like it was like, I right. fucked it up so badly that it was the only option was to like stop. And there's allow no like, everybody. fast drums to allow you to <laughs> yeah. uh, kind of hide it. You're like, Oh, literally it's like spotlight on me. I just but, had to uh, let everybody you know. laugh at me. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Humbling. So, um, you know, I want to transition into something um, that you guys did earlier in 2022 um, and something that I thought was like really, really cool as a Canadian, um, as like the Comeback Kid, Cancer Bass, Misery Signals, kind of like Canadian domination tour. Um, But I think the coolest part of that is that, you know, you guys hit so many towns and so many small cities that like arguably probably haven't had a show since COVID hit like since that event. So I was curious if you could just talk about like, um, you know, I don't know how much you were in the planning of that or like, you know, how, how it meant as someone to be able to like go into like smaller towns in BC and play, play places on on the Island as well. Um, yeah. Any, anything off the top of your head from that tour specifically that, that, I mean, uh, that stuck with you. It was, I mean, it it was better than I, I thought it was like, I think all of us believed in it and like thought it was going to be like a really good tour. We knew it was going to be a good tour, especially in like the big cities, but, but uh, it was crazy. Like definitely far surpassed. I think anybody's expectations in like the smaller towns, especially with those shows were crazy and you would mm-hmm. never, ever expect that. Like Victoria was insane for sure. Like I'm, I mean, I would, I, I guess I shouldn't like speak for cancer bats, but I'm sure it was the biggest show that any of us had, had played in Victoria, but it was such like a good package of bands too, you know, like, like misery signals. I, that band is just like, and with Jesse too, is like so important to Western Canada. And like, I mean, absolutely all, so many Canadian people like music fans and like kids and stuff, but uh misery signals and like, cancer bats and it was it was i don't know it it it, it worked well because i feel like like we're all in like generally in that same like like league you know what i mean like music wise that same like realm but everybody kind of has their own different like fans you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like there might be somebody who like loves 
misery signals and like kind of listens to cancer bats and comeback kid. But for the most part, it was just like everybody brought something to the table, which was, which was awesome. And then, yeah, like, dude, for like, I shouldn't say this, but like, for me, like Fernie and Nelson, I thought we we're just going to be absolute write-offs. You know what I mean? Like, it's like cool that we're going to be doing those shows, but, and those places are beautiful, but mm. it would just be like, okay, we're going to play these bars and they're going to be shit, you know, like whatever it's, it's, it's a small well, town. Like, you know? I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong to say that because it's like, it's Canada in and out of itself is so spread out. And like when, you know, for a lot of the American listeners for this podcast, like Fernie and Nelson are just these tiny little mountain, like ski towns that like, arguably like don't have a music scene so like yeah. and i'm sure there's you know maybe one or two people that are like hey we actually do so yeah. sorry if i'm offending you but it's like again like seeing that 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 uh that tour poster and seeing all the dates i was like damn like how crazy like would it would it be for people to be doing that but like like to your point it might be like we might play to 50 people who would be over the moon moon excited and then we just get to hang out in the mountains for the day or the next day or whatever. Yeah. But it, it, it sounded like like Fernie and Nelson were the two that like really surprised you the most. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Like it it uh like I mean they sold out, which is and I mean even still like with them selling out and they sold out like pretty far in advance. Not that they were like big venues or anything like that, but sure. But even even when they sold out, it was kind of like, okay, so because I don't think there's well, there's obviously not a ton to do there. That's not like outdoor activity related. So so it's like, you know, I'm sure a lot of people in you just think a lot of people in that town, you know, like there's something coming through to do. So why not buy a ticket? Maybe they're going to bring the kids or something. So you expect it to just maybe be like a bunch of just people like posted up sitting at a table watching and then like maybe like a 20 person like push pit in the corner or something like that. You know what I mean? Like really punking it up. But, yeah. uh, but yeah, dude, those shows, like they went off, they were really good. Like there was people that were like, there was fans, like legitimate, like fans of like all the bands mm-hmm. at those shows, you know, that like drove from other small towns close by or lived in Nelson or Fernie or were like, I mean, like with mountain towns, obviously you get like a ton of Australians and stuff coming there to work in the winter. So there was like a lot of people like foreigners that were there that were fans of the bands that were coming out to the shows and they were sick. Like they were actually like really good. So it was kind of fun to see, you know, like it's cool to know that, that the, that you can play those places and, and, uh, and there's people there and it's like worthwhile going through, you know, um, because I feel like for a really, really long time, like that hasn't really been the case. And I think that also like speaks to just like the growth of like hardcore music in general, like in the last like while, you know what I mean? It's just, it's like a different world than it than i've ever seen you know in my like when i've been in in kind of involved in this or just like in this like world you know it's Mm -hmm. it's pretty crazy to see you know what i mean like it's uh but yeah those those shows are fucking dope i i and that tour was so much fun it it was really really fun i think (coughs) this this year specifically like there's no other tours or bands doing that risky of a play especially for canadian stuff in my opinion and to hear it go like to see it do so well and just to hear that like even the smaller shows like things were selling out and people were hyped and having good, a good time like you know at, like for smaller bands even like i talked to people and it's like yeah like you might have those shows where there's people sitting down there's a 20 person push pit but like people will people will be grateful and people will buy merch and people will like you know like really recognize like how how important that you know you showing up in their town it is for them so you know whether you're a huge band like comeback kid or a small band like i feel like you shouldn't i to me i like thinking about the potential of like what if we played in you know like this place where i know that there's a couple bands and maybe us coming helps spark a couple things and then that place in five or ten years becomes a hotbed for the music scene like stranger things have happened yeah yeah, absolutely yeah i mean i it's uh and i and and to be fair on top of all that like the venues we played there were really good were like rat like they were good venues they weren't you know like i was it was kind of like surprising i i didn't really know what to expect going through there but like they were 
they were great spots, especially considering how small those towns are, you know? And, uh, yeah, I mean, I would, I hope that we get to go back eventually at some point, you know, it's going to yeah. be a minute, I'm sure until we do another run through there, but, but, uh, it's worthwhile, man. It's really sick. Totally. Um, okay. Chase, I always ask this question for any person that comes on the podcast that, is a part of a project that has a, a really big discography. And I've asked this for Goose and for Jeremy and for Stu. So, you know, they've all given various answers based off of the role in the band. So, in your opinion, most underrated comeback kid song and most overrated comeback kid song? Oh, fuck. Uh, hmm. And again, you can speak on that in whichever way you want. Um, to, I think the best example that I can give is um, Stu was mentioning, yeah, this song's a little overrated because it's like really boring to play on guitar. But like that song vocally might not even hit Goose's radar. So yeah. that's just an example of, of how you could spin it when you're thinking about it. Um... But if you're like, if you got to take like, I, yo, this song is, you know, <laughs> I'm fucking tired of hearing this song. Then I mean, please, speaker man. I mean, I feel like the obvious answer for most overrated would be Wake the Dead. But it's also like for sure. I mean, in my opinion, is my favorite Comeback Kid song. So there's just like there's so many other there's so much other good stuff. Um, most. Those guys are good. Those guys probably all said like newer stuff, but I'm like, in my personal opinion, like the older stuff is like my favorite. So, <clears throat> most overrated song. Uh, I'm going to say maybe uh, should know better because I just don't love playing it live, but people okay. really like, but people really like it. Mm -hmm. uh most underrated song mm. why does should know better not do it for for you like is it know. just kind I, of a, a we've just song we've based just, wise we, yeah we've just always played we just always played it that should know better or uh or but this is just like my from my personal uh experience should know better or um Wasted arrows maybe would be my my most overrated, but most mm -hmm. underrated maybe like I don't know, die tonight or something like that. Something old that's really dope. I feel like those yeah. songs are like a little bit forgotten about. We play we play old stuff a lot in the U.S. and I think like people still really dig like stuff off Turn It Around and obviously off Wake the Dead. But right, um, but I I don't know. Those songs don't like pop as much as like the Wake the Dead stuff and Died Night. It's like one of my favorite comeback hit songs ever. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, don't I know. think um I think the last time I saw you guys, I was like one of my I think in my opinion one of the most underrated. Well, my two underrated comeback hit songs in my opinion. I think I told Goose and Jeremy this is Losing Sleep. Oh yeah, Losing Sleep's good. Manifest off of um symptoms and cures i think manifest is one of the hardest comeback could like riffs ever and it's so simplistic it's just like din, 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 din. like yeah dude so good i uh i, I mean I, I guess i've i would maybe have a new uh answer for most underrated it's kind of it's kind of like a weird reasoning though like there's a song that was that was written by Stu for heavy steps that never got put on the record that okay is in my opinion the best song that was written during heavy oh, steps i can't remember what it's called though now because we didn't it's a heavy it. b-side yeah what the fuck's it called um dude it is so fucking good uh and it never got put on the record because they were like there was like you know it was maybe like a riff or two was like bitten off like a i'm not gonna say who it was bitten off of but like it, it was like a it was very like 90s like i don't know whatever <clears throat> anyways i i didn't i didn't hear the rip off but they i think Stu got like cold feet at the last minute and was like scared you know that like people were gonna call him on oh, it it's almost like, yeah yeah but uh but I, it will be released eventually like on an ep or something but it for sure is like the best in my opinion was the best song that 
well, would have been the best song in Heavy Steps, but never made the record. Yeah. 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 It was, oh, fuck, what the fuck was it called? We'll have to wait and see. I'll, I'll, I can't I'll remember. use this clip if it ever comes in yeah. the light of day. Yeah, yeah, it will. It will yeah. for sure. It has to. It's so fucking good, man. It's it's one of my favorite. Yeah, it was it was the best song written for the record. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of of heavy steps, you know, I think all the last Goose was the last person I had on the podcast, and it was before the record actually came out. But um, like you know, the record's been out for a bit now, and you guys have done plenty of touring internationally about it um what has been the reception or like the certain songs that you didn't expect to hit as as hard as they did or or be received the way that they are um i mean it like it was pretty surprising to see people singing stuff like so quickly you know like usually it takes like months if not like maybe a year until like people like fully get into the new stuff Right, but like the title track, "Heavy Steps," we opened a, a a lot of, I mean, most of our shows with that song, like this year, and it's crazy. Like it sometimes gets like maybe the best response of all our songs, except for obviously like "Wake the Dead." Typically, like we'll kind of cap it all off, and that'll really, really go off. But um, mm-hmm. "Heavy Steps" is like a fucking has been like a big fave. It seems a lot of people that have come to see us this year um we started playing dead on the fence pretty recently and that that song like not so much for like sing-along wise but like just for people like dancing and like going off like dead on the fence has been really good yeah it's been cool like i mean it's weird too for me because like a lot of some of like my favorite songs on the record like like i said i'm kind of i was always a little bit more of a punker so uh like uh um face the fire like you know that song's got a lot of melody and i re- i really liked that song that was like one of my favorite favorites on the record you know it d- it hasn't seemed like it's really like gone over the way that i thought it would you know it's kind of been a little bit of a sleeper it seems but i mean i don't know that's just the way things kind of work out you know what i mean people gravitate like like absolute off of outsider you know like that song is is a wild song for us but I, it's not a song i would expect people to like really get into you know what i mean right um it's 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 so strange like you're like this like i remember i can't remember which one it was but i think jeremy was like when we were writing wake the dead in the studio we all were like this is a song and and not like this is the song but this is a song and then it ended up being the song that like everyone who knows comeback kid knows that song but majority of the songs and i've been in this in my own scenarios too where it's like oh this is the one that people are like or uh this is kind of like a not like i'm phoning it in but i it's just it's it's filling the space i haven't soaked as much sweat and blood and tears into this song specifically and then that one ends ends up popping and just really doing well and then the one that you like overly like complicated and like really tried to like articulate it just maybe doesn't go as far so it 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 really is a is a check at times to be like you know you you just put stuff out and the people will decide what is sick and what's kind of yeah yeah yeah, totally yeah it's i feel like it's i mean it i i know obviously it can happen but like i feel like it's it's so fucking rare to be working you know with in a band or working on music and have that moment where like you have a song where everybody is like this is it you know like this is the one you know yeah i mean it 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 definitely like happens and you know it when when it when it happens but uh but you know yeah typically it's it's always like you know you know not everybody's like in that same spot you know and you're right like it's sometimes it's just up to the people to fucking decide what what the dope thing is and what the what the bop is and what the flop is <laughs> what's a bop and what's a flop i love that yeah. um yeah so uh we've we've talked a lot about comeback it on this podcast but a, a huge part of i think your musical journey even getting into that band like we said at the beginning was living with the lions so you know talk to me about like the origin of that band because when i was prepping for this podcast i was like Oh, Chase used to be you. You were just playing guitar originally, and then moved over to yeah. vocals. Yeah. So, so 
yeah, just talk to me about the very beginnings of that band and, you know, kind of the transition to, you know, uh, I, some other people have, have said it on the podcast. I think it was Walter from Rotting Out where he did a similar thing and then had to, in his words, pull a comeback kid and move from guitar to vocals <laughs> because that was such a big thing. So, um, yeah, like talk to me about the early days and, and how the switch came to be. So, I mean, wh- like growing up in Comox, I, I was playing in bands there um, and I played in a band with, with like a bunch of my friends, still my friends today. We were called Drake's kind of weird it was like named after like a snowboard binding company we were all into like snowboarding and shit mm. but playing a band called so we're now nowadays being named after one of the biggest artists in the world yeah for sure <laughs> like i'll never be able to find any of our music online anymore you know it's like right, right. it's gonna be buried <laughs> yeah. like a thousand pages back on google but <clears throat> so we i played in that band and then we broke up when i like right after i graduated high school and i moved to vancouver and the singer of that band, Matt Postal, also moved to Vancouver. And and then, you know, like randomly, we ended up meeting these three dudes from Alberta. It was Landon and Lauren and our friend Shane. And we ended up, Matt ended up like moving into a house with them. We just like randomly met them at shows like through friends and started kind of hanging out. They were like really friendly and, and it like weirded me out, you know, like... Mm-hmm just like I guess that's just how people from Alberta are like just really friendly you know I just had my I had like my Vancouver guard up I was like yo why are you so nice this is fucking weird dude (laughs) you know like Vancouver has that like reputation of like kind of being cliquey and weird and these guys just like were like yo let's have beers and like hang out and like do fun shit and I was just like you guys are fucking weird I don't I don't understand what's going on here why are you so nice yeah hey bro but uh, yeah, we ended up, Matt ended up moving into there. He needed a place to live. He ended up moving in with them. And then, and then uh, I was hanging out there more because Matt was there and they played in a band and they had a jam space and we started jamming and then that became Lions. And uh, so Matt was singing and I was playing guitar. And uh, yeah, and then we just started writing music. I We would write a ton in the basement of our house. We all we all ended up living together there and uh and uh wrote music recorded some records and then and then eventually um you know a few records in matt decided to quit leave the band and we were like midway through recording holy shit our second like full length so i kind of had to finish like writing all the vocals i had to demo all the vocals like we were pretty fucking close to getting dropped from our label at that point because the band was just like into complete disarray halfway through recording this record and then we reached out to Stu, who was just at that point had just left misery signals and had just done a project called low talker where he was singing and playing guitar and it was you know kind of gruff vocals similar to like what we had before so we hit up Stu and asked if he wanted to sing and he ended up moving out to vancouver and we've I finished writing the vocals and we demoed them with Stu and sent them the label. They liked it. And then we just finished that record and toured a bit. And I mean, we toured fucking really hard. And at that time it was like a massive grind. Like lions weren't really like making money, but we were fucking really spending it. We were like good, really good at that. Not good at making money, really good at spending money. <laughs> it was just kind of a weird scenario. Cause like we put our first record was like, what had I mean it had like some buzz to it and we were when we put out holy shit we got picked up by a management company and we signed to a few other labels you know and and things were like there was really high expectations I think and so we were doing all these tours like we like opened up for day to remember in Europe and which was like a tour that you just like we could you know you you can't say no to that tour it was like you got to do this because it's going to be a big one and uh and so we, but it's like, well, you know, like we'd look at, I mean, not that it's like about money necessarily, but it would be like, okay, well, we're going to lose thousands of dollars and our management would just be like, yeah, it's all good. Just like, we'll figure it out later. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it was a lot of stuff like that, where we were just doing, getting like good tours or whatever and doing them, but like losing money. And then eventually it, and it just never really panned out the way that I think anybody was expecting, you know? Sure. 
And, and then, uh, and it was like, I think a hard time for Stu as well, because he just, he, you know, it was, it was a serious grind and coming from misery signals, like, you know, you're kind of used to a certain standard and, and there was an opening in comeback kid. So he ended up going to comeback kid, which was like, you know, a kind of like a true testament of our friendship. Cause there was definitely some like hard feelings for a, for a while there, but, right. but, uh, but it all it all kind of worked itself out, and then that's when I started singing for Lions, which would have been like two thousand and probably two thousand and uh, like twelve or eleven or something like that. And then we just and then we did a bunch more stuff. But that's kind of that's kind of how it all happened. Like like I had already been like writing and recording vocals for the band, like demoing stuff, you know, pre Stu coming in. So it was pretty natural, like to just kind of move and I mean like at that point it's like are we going to get like a third vocalist random person to come in like nobody's going to want right. to do this let's just keep it in house and like you know we we uh yeah we just made that switch and it was it was pretty easy and then you know I we were, we were busy for a while after that but things kind of slowed down a bit like I'd say like around 2014 2015 yeah um you brought up the the album holy shit um and you can correct the record if I'm, I'm talking out of turn here, but I, I, to my recollection, when that album was coming out, just the fact that there was an album that said "Holy shit" in big, all caps letters, um, I don't know if there was issues within the scene about that, but I felt like you guys got pushed back more on like record stores not wanting to like put that out or like things like that is it, am i right in thinking that that when Man, i was like prepping for this i was like wasn't there some kind of like online or not even online but like real world like pushback we we of- got in yeah we got in big shit we got in big shit for that <laughs> like no like pun intended we got in, in big trouble like we so in canada just to like i mean i'm sure you're but very aware of this but just to explain to people that might not be in canada there's like an arts funding program called factor and pretty much every Canadian band, when they when they go to make a record, they apply for funding because they basically will help you pay for your rec- your recording. Sure. Um, but you know, like when you apply for that money and you get it to do the to do a record, like there's kind of like guidelines that you have to like a- adhere to. And you know, holy shit was a play on like the holy bible. You know, like we we called the record holy shit we wanted to call it holy shit and we didn't really know what the album artwork was going to be and the dude that had been doing all our artwork cody uh fennel he kind of designed this like this like mock like bible you know and it, and it was like he took it to like a degree that i don't think any of us imagined like you know like it was like a mock bible and like jesus was like was uh, naughty doggy yeah no <laughs> but uh, Jesus was like inside the mock Bible, like Jesus was like depicted as like a piece of poo, you know, like and we were young and just like thought this shit was so outlandish and like funny, you know, like we were just right. were like, this is ridiculous, but like, whatever, like, let's fucking, this is hilarious to us. So let's do it. And he like, there's a bunch of photos in there that were just like silly. It was just fucking silly. And, uh, and the, sorry, the idea of calling it holy shit, like that was like, was that just more of like, what if we call their album Holy Shit? Or was there like, we really want to do, like, it was very specific. It wasn't like a joke that turned into a serious thing. Or was it, it, it like I mean, it, we just a thought jokingly it seriously thing? Yeah, it was just like, I mean, we just thought it would be like a, fun, like a funny name for the record. And then the mm-hmm. artwork just kind of became, it was like, the artwork was an idea based on like the name of the record, you know? Sure. Okay. Uh, and, uh. Yeah, so we like we kind of had the silly artwork. It was fucking crazy. Like, and we knew we knew people would be like kind of bummed about it. But at the same time, like we're not we weren't a very we were a pretty small band, so we didn't really think that it would there would be like a lot of attention there. You know, like I didn't really right. think it would it would it would make any kind of wave. So well, at this time, are yeah. you guys on a like you're on a label, so you're yeah. having to submit these things? And did yeah. they have any like, ooh, I don't know, or were they like, yeah, this is a great idea? I mean, no, they we were warned like going into it when they <laughs> they got the when they got <laughs> we the final <laughs> when they got the final the final like version of the artwork and they saw it, 
they were like, this is risky for sure. Like you could do, there could be some issues with this. And we were like, no, like it's funny. You know what? Like you guys are being ridiculous. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. And so we put the record out. So when you, when you put a record out that's, that's funded by factor, you need to put like a logo on the back that says like, like factor, help pay for this and a Canadian government like logo, you know, and like, like every band takes this money. But at the time we had a conservative government, it was Stephen Harper and they were looking. Right. Okay. Okay. I'm understanding the sideline. They were really, really looking at that time at trying to cut budgets. And definitely one of the big things was, was cutting like some of factors funding because it was just something that I think they didn't really see like a, it, it really having like a any kind of importance you know right so as we're like we put this record out and and how it all kind of started was our record label Adeline Records they were based in LA they had sent the record out to be reviewed by a bunch of like papers and magazines or whatever and somebody at the LA Times saw it some like I guess writer that was like maybe more on the conservative ends of things and saw the Canadian government logo on the back of the record and like look was looking into it and then like wrote this article about how the Canadian government was like was funding like anti-Christian propaganda or whatever and (laughs) and yeah and then and then like because it was the LA Times or whatever the Canadian yeah, it's not like, just like some online dude, like person it's no like that has a big name recognition. Dude, and then it was like we were on tour this at, at the time in America and we got a phone call like within like two or three days of that record that article coming out and it was people at our label in Canada and they were like don't answer your phones like we were just about to come over the border into Toronto to play a show in Toronto like don't answer your phones. If anybody tries to talk to you about what's going on with your album artwork, like don't fucking talk to them. Don't say anything. And we were like, what the fuck is going on? Like, what are you talking about? And we get over the border and it's like front page news in Toronto, front page news in Vancouver. Like, like the government, like the, so the, I guess like the, I can't remember what, what his like exact title was, but there's a dude named, named James Moore. That was like the MP of like, he was like, the culture the minister of culture maybe or something like that i'm and gonna a, i'm gonna fact check you yeah. on that wall there was there was a there there was a photo of him holding our record up in parliament they were like making this insane example of us you know like like bands are putting out like this trash with canadian taxpayers money like this shouldn't be allowed to happen you know um mm. <laughs> dude it was it's fucking wild it was crazy, man. Like, so we were like showing up to our shows and there was like news crews there trying to talk to us, and, like track us down. And dude, it was crazy. Like our label, like was scared. They were going to get all their funding cut. Um, they were scared. We were going to get like barred from, from getting grants. And like, everybody was just trying to like appease the conservative government. It was a fucking disaster, dude. Like it blew up into like this crazy thing. And, and in the end, I mean, really what, what ended up happening was factor was like given an ultimatum. They were like, it was like you either this band pays money back to you or I mean, I, they were just, they were basically just told like this album artwork needs to change or you need to get the money back. And that was like the ultimatum that we were faced with. They were like, they were like, you can change the album artwork and keep the money or you can pay us back and keep the album artwork. And at that point it was like, well, fuck, like, we can't change it. Like, that's just fucking stupid. You know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. it's the, it would just be like, we're going to change it to say, Holy crap. Or like, yeah, you know, but like, I mean, like, dude, I, I was just like, it, it, you know, and, and it's a fucking joke, you know, like we weren't trying to make any kind of like political statement. And at the end, and yeah. I mean like what it kind of, I guess did to all of us at the time. And I, I know it, you know, like there's bigger problems in the world and it's kind of like a first world kind of problem, but it opened my eyes to like, I mean, if you have like, really wait if you have like an arts funding program in canada arts funding you know um and the government all of a sudden can like dictate what is or is not allowed to be like Mm -hmm. like funded through that like i don't like i don't think that's like an arts funding program anymore you know what i mean like it's just a fine line it's like once you start saying like okay you can't do that 
like that's kind of more like of a propaganda th- propaganda thing to me than it is like a arts funding program. And that was like kind of like our the the rationale behind our decision to like keep our artwork. It's like, well, we have mm-hmm. to fucking keep our artwork the way it is. Like, even though it's fucking stupid, it's a piece of poo. Like, who fucking cares? You know what I mean? Like, even right. though it's so dumb that people are offended by this, it's like, well, we can't fucking bow down and change this. You know, it'd just be, it would be how could you like live with yourself? So it was just kind of funny seeing the, the mechanisms, you know, like of the government and like how that shit all like all worked out in the end over something so fucking mm-hmm. stupid. But I think really at the end of the day, like they were just trying to make an example of us. Like they wanted to cut funding from factor. They saw their opportunity and they took it, you know, and they tried to make an right. example of us. And luckily, luckily for factor and like for all the other bands that 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 use that shit like they 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 didn't end up cutting any funding from them you know like or they didn't have enough time to to make it all happen you know like Mm because Stephen harper was out like shortly after that but it was crazy man we were like getting invited to go on like political talk shows and like it was so fucking ridiculous wild dude oh my god there was like like the fact that like there's a conservative politician that's holding your record that's probably the most hardcore leaning thing or to ever enter yeah. the office the oval office or Dude. whatever not all like, but know, you know what i mean people were like saying it was like a publicity stunt and shit but like i mean we didn't think anybody would care you know what i mean right. like there's just no way to ever they they i mean they did it to them if they think that like we you know, got publicity off of it. Like they were the ones that fucking made that happen, not us. You know what I mean? Like right. I didn't expect anything like that to happen. So yeah, it was kind of funny at the end of the day, like how, how insane that all got. But at the time it was like, dude, it was, it was stressful. Like it was for, for a while there, it was really intense. There's a lot well, of shit going I, on. Cause the year that this is all <coughs> happening is, is 2014. Um, no, it would have that. been it would have been like 2010, 2011, probably. Okay, like that. so like, it, well over ten years ago, as far as the time we're recording this. So like, the the internet exists, but not to this like you post one thing, it, it could spread like spread like wildfire. In no, yeah, minutes. No, so it's it's wild that a that that was like just going ultra crazy, and if anything had more because you know things can spread super fast online now but there's like it's just the the tea of the day so it's like something can spread around get tons of people are talking about it and then like no one's talking about it the next day and that's anything from a good situation to a bad situation you know yeah. someone dies on the internet and then no one talks about it the next day except for like maybe their f- family and friends or a celeb i'm using a yeah. celebrity as an example yeah, yeah but back then it's like the fact that you're having news crews show up at shows invited to political and we're like we're just a band that like put out a record like that we're just making a joke about it so so there's that um but yeah like in the moment i'm sure it's like like you're having a like holy shit kind of like Dude. unintended like yeah, kind of yeah moment. for sure <laughs> it was so it, i mean it was it was kind of a weird situation because i mean everything in us just wanted to be like fuck you guys like fuck fuck all of you you know what i mean like right you know, like our, I, I think there was definitely a feeling in the moment, like our label was like, so, and rightfully so like very concerned about the situation from their like mm-hmm. standpoint, like that their business was going to be like directly affected. And I think we kind of got the feeling through that process that like, they didn't really have our backs. You know what I mean? Sure. And yeah. and I, and in hindsight, like I understand why, like they, their like business was on the line. You know what I mean? Like they were threat. They was very, a very scary situation for us, but we were kind of like on our own, you know? And that was like, so it was really hard to like bite our tongues and like try to take the high road on it and like be like diplomatic about it. Because like when you're a kid and you make a poo joke and like fucking politicians are getting involved, you just want to be like, <laughs> whoa, yo, like fuck you guys. Like you guys are acting yo, so everybody stupid poos, right now. chill. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but, I, and I mean like, you know, like it was weird. We had like conversations with like, like Landon's stepfather who is like religious was like really deeply offended by it, you know? And we had to have like conversations so with him about that shit, you know? But I mean, that being said, it's like Lauren's parents were also religious and they thought it was funny. It was just a really mm-hmm. like, it was so everybody took it in a, such a different way. But, uh, but we like, we, you know, like we didn't, you know, we were open to like having those conversations for sure. You know, like 
to us, we just, we weren't trying to piss anybody off or offend anybody. We were just, I don't know, just being kids. Like, yeah, you know, it was a stupid I, joke. I, so. I think all things considered, the thing that's really interesting to me is that it, it's an album, it's album artwork that works. It like, it hits you and it, it causes like some kind of reaction, good or bad, clearly. But like, you know, it's, you know, it's not this like crazy thing that has all these things going on and all these different colors. It's like, here's this text with a little bit of texture and like, take it or leave it. And, uh, and I don't know, it's just, it's, it's wild to hear how, y you know, like people argue nowadays that everyone's like really, you know, soft and can just get easily offended over anything. But it sounds like, you know, that historically has, has happened in different ways as well. So, um, I, I applaud you guys for not bowing to changing it and not having to run the situation, but I'm sure that was just very stressful at the time. Oh man, it was, it was, it was weird. It was just a weird thing to navigate when you're like 22 or 23 too, you know? Right. And it's like, right. I don't know, but it was, it was funny. Like, especially in hindsight, looking back at it now, it was fucking pretty fucking funny. So tying how, like tying the two bands that you're a part of together to kind of bring these two segments of the podcast into one, um, you know, living with lions is definitely, you know, comeback kids seems like the full-time thing. That's like just going and going, going, flying all over the world and playing all these shows and, you know, living with lions, uh, you know, like you said that there's a couple things that happen, but it's just a little bit more like sparse. Like, is there like more stuff coming on the way for living with Ly living with lions that, or is it like, how, how is that with balancing the, the comeback kid machine at times? I mean, it's pretty, it's easy nowadays just cause everybody's kind of older. Um, for the lions guys, like Landon lives in Calgary. Um, and the rest of us are here, but you know, everybody's just kind of, they have like their lives, you know, they have their partners and, and it's pretty busy for everybody for the most part. So as far as like touring goes, it's not really like a priority, you know, for any of those guys. I mean, we'll definitely play shows and like release more music. Like those, all, like the guys in the band are, you know, we're my best friends. So like, and you know, we love doing it. We still really love doing it and we'll never stop like making music together when we can. It's, it's like one of my favorite things to do any, like all of us, you know, um but uh but as far as like playing shows go it, it's just kind of like whenever we have time to do it and uh and we haven't released music in a while either so we wrote like i mean just like every other band like during the pandemic we wrote a record so hopefully when this year kind of mellows out for comeback kid you know like next year or something like that we'll have a chance to like record it and put it out and and hopefully play some more shows if it, if there's if there's the time to do it next year but it's hard man it's just like you know lauren had a lauren had a kid in january and his, his first baby and uh and combat kids has been so busy it's just you know like it's just hard to fit it in um mm -hmm. but uh but that's just i don't know well what, I, the nice thing is that like for us it's like we're never gonna like kind of call it a day you know what i mean they're like we're just gonna leave it open-ended and, and do stuff yeah. whenever we can you know what i mean yeah i think <clears throat> i think b when i was first getting into this it would, o it would always annoy me of like when bands would be like go on hiatus or like kind of do these like not break up and they're like not doing things for so long but now like way later i'm like no oh, it totally makes sense like people have personal things that come up in their lives or they just have different bands that they're focusing on mm -hmm. and i don't think it's bad for those bands not to like it doesn't need to be black or white it, there can be a lot of gray for band to be like we exist but like we're not tr we're not taking up space that other bands who are super active and you know hitting the road and doing all these things like they should have the spotlight right now like we'll be here but we'll you know come back when we're ready to and i think mm. that's awesome yeah, yeah absolutely mm -hmm. yeah i i wish that there was some way to write out a list of every single record because there was a lot of records that came out like in the top like moments of the pandemic but not like written like um so i wish that there was like a list of like all those records that either have come out already or haven't yet clearly like like you said like there's one that's been written but just to show like 
in a time of such like chaos, like all this awesome music was was written and, and people were kind of put into, you know, the the creative situation to like, you know, feel the bad, but like output some good. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I, I honestly can't even imagine how many bands wrote records during that time. Oh, yeah. It's like, what yeah, else yeah. are you going to do, you know? Yeah. Um, okay, so Chase, a couple other questions before we wrap up. Tell me about this, um, your name being in a Dagger Mouth song and how that came to be. Oh, uh, it's actually a pretty short story. I, um, it's kind of funny they did that because that song's like totally like a roast on somebody, but it's not a, a roast on me. It's like they're just <laughs> oh, shit what? on somebody, but they like we were on tour with them, uh, Lions and and uh, and Dagger Mouth were on tour. And I was sleeping on a floor in somebody's basement and everybody was like out partying that night. And, and somebody came back at night or maybe it was in the morning. I can't remember. And like stepped on me. And I just, I guess like in my slumber was like, this is Chase Brenneman. And they were like, Oh fuck shit. And then they just thought that was funny. So they like name put it like named a song that or whatever. Right. But it just so happened to be a song where they're like just shitting on somebody. So everybody thinks it's like beef or something like that, but it definitely <laughs> is. <isn't>. It's fake beef. Mm. That's really fun. So you had so do you talk in your sleep or is that just like a one one and done? I like, I think it was just like a one off. Like I think I I probably like kind of semi woke up or something like that. Right. This is I'm just rid of it. Damn. Okay. <laughs> um yeah, cuz I don't know, there's there's not there's very few people that I know have their first and last name in a in a punk or or hardcore song. So I was like that that stands out to me. Dude, <laughs> Stu Stu has one as well. Oh, yeah. Is it also a Dagger Mask song? No, it's a full blast song. It's called oh, Stu Ross. Okay. Good dude, great dude. <laughs> I, I can back that. Stu Ross is yeah. a good and great dude. Yeah, Absolutely. he gets a lot of love, man. Yeah. Is that also a diss track song about someone else, though? I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I, I can't it's remember just, that it's just about, a, like but... It's just a song about how great Stu is. Yeah. I yeah. hope. I, at least I hope. Des I don't know. Des deservedly so. I, 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 yeah, I can't remember. I can't remember what that song's about. But yeah, he's got he's got a dedicated song. Everybody's right. got a every every like every standout like touring musician deserves a deserves their own. We like we named a song. Lions named a song after <clears throat> Dave Costa, the bass player from Boys Night Out. Okay, they were like one of the first bands to ever like take us on tour way back. First, like mm -hmm. you know, kind of more like established band. And uh, yeah, yeah, he was he was always like the wild party guy. And back then, we like lo really liked to party like very hard. So he was mm -hmm. he was our one of our our inspirations. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think i think it's a it's a move to you know if you write you write a diss song just name it after your friend that you like <laughs> yeah and then it's like really confusing <laughs> yeah cause some cause some fake beef yeah yeah fake beef is i think fake beef is actually better than real beef oh 100 mm -hmm. it's the best nobody gets hurt yes. no, <laughs> no one gets hurt and like you can just fully lean into it and then people are like oh my god and you're like You'll find out that this yeah. is all in, in, in good fun. Um, Chase, the very last question that I ask every guest who comes here on the podcast uh, to, to end off our episode is a favorite Mosh-related story that you would like to share. So that's anything that's first to your head that could be wholesome, that could be gruesome, that could be something that is tied to you or just something that you saw at a show. Um, whatever is first to your head is how we start to end the episode. Mosh related? Can it be like stage dive related? Is that does that count? Mo mosh is it's an umbrella term. So whether it's pitting, um, stage dive, stage diving is a part of mosh Dude. culture. Okay. So I'll uh, uh, um, fuck. Let me just think of like how this all went down. Uh, okay, <laughs> so. So when we did the tour with, uh, man, Kevin's going to be like pissed at me for maybe telling this story, but, uh, <laughs> when we did the tour with, uh, with every time I die and knocked loose in 2017, uh, 
we were over. So the end of the tour was in the UK, and every time I die was headlining all the UK shows, and they were fucking insane, like you know, massive shows, mm-hmm. crazy. And the drummer from Knock Loose and I, Kev, we were oh Paxson uh, or Paxson, sorry, Paxson. Yes, uh, we were uh, we were chilling at side stage, and uh, and Knock Loose or um, Etip was playing, and it was fucking crazy. And I was like, Yo, I'm gonna stage dive. And he's like, Okay, cool, like. And I went and I just like, you know, peeled off and like jumped off the monitor, did a little flippy and like went in the crowd and like come back around. And, uh, and he's like, damn, he's like, should I do that? And I'm like, yeah, dude, for sure. And he's like, what do I do? And I'm just like, just run and then jump off the monitor. But there was, there was a barricade show. So you had to like, you had to ascend it a bit. You had you know, to commit. It wasn't, yeah. You just, yeah. you can't just, you can't just like, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a bit extreme, but he was like, yo, okay. Like I got this. I'm like, yeah, just like, just boost off the monitor, make sure you run and just like, just go for it. It'll be fine. Like you're all good. I'm just like, okay, cool. And he like, he runs out and he like boosts off the monitor. And like, as soon as he takes off, we were all like, this is not going to go well. And it was like, definitely more up than like out. You know what I mean? And he like, <laughs> he's like no shirt on fucking flying like gracefully through the air. And it's just like about halfway it's just like a dead stop and it was just full taco on the fucking barricade like (laughs) ribs to barricade like the gnarliest and it's like you're like face to face with the crowd you know what i mean like you just see this guy just like and he just fucking like rolled back into like security and was just keeled over and it was like maybe the gnarliest looking stage dive as far as like like pain wise that i can that i can think of like recently so he kind of like came up like an airplane yeah exactly <laughs> like and then just like taco like taco on the oh fucking, man you know like rib to rib to barricade dude it was it yeah. was really funny yeah pax on yeah dude oh my god oh, dude and yeah. he was fine like he was fine in the end but i i mean okay that's good because it, it i'm i'm thinking about uh i i recently i was listening to a podcast where um i guess like they were talking about post malone um kind of biffed it at one of his shows it, not in a stage dive way but there's uh, a part of his stage where i guess there's like an opening where uh, like an acoustic guitar will come out at some point in the night and he just totally forgot about it turned around and just like ribs like onto the stage oh, no, and dude. i think yeah so like i'm imagining like I was listening to that last night, and so hearing Paxson, who's was like, yeah. "Man," and, and Paxson's a friend of the show. He he's been on here before, so yeah, I'm surprised that. Dude, uh, I there's don't probably know. a reason he didn't share that story on his. Dude, episode. I'm sure. I'm sure he like maybe didn't. Maybe he would be like super stoked that I like shared that. But but yeah, he uh, it was it was it was gnarly. It was it was really gnarly. That's like that's fully like skateboarding, like snowboarding terminology, like when you like biff it on a rail and like, and like fall on your ribs, that's a taco. So I don't know if that's like part of like, like stage dive or mosh slang yet, but it needs to be adopted. I'm sure us talking about it, people are going to be like, Oh yeah, I was at this one show and they're just going to use that a little bit more. So I mean, like, obviously like, like barricades are, are shitty and nobody like wants that shit, but unfortunately they're there at some shows. So tacoing and tacoing is, is something the 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 risk of tacoing goes up if there's a barricade for sure. There's not really you know anything to taco on um, without a barricade. a barricade list. Yeah, show. for sure, exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, dude, Chase, this has been such a fun chat. Um, obviously, big fan of both the projects that you're in, and it was just like a pleasure to talk to you. And you're you're an you're a really great storyteller, honestly. With some of the you know you painted all these pictures super well off of everything that we talked about. Um, all of the band links, your links and all that shit will be in the show notes in the description. But if there's anything you want to shout out, plug or send the people off with the floor is yours, my friend. Um, I guess, uh, we got furnace fest next weekend, which will be fucking sick. <clears throat> and we have, uh, some shows on the East coast. This is all comeback kid stuff shows on the East coast after that. And then fest. So, I guess for like anybody that sees this, I mean, Furnace Fest will probably already happen by the time this gets posted, but yeah, we'll be in Florida. We'll be on the East coast of Canada and hopefully we see people out there. Should be really fun. So yeah. 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 I, um, you know, it, it, it's really cool to see how much 
Kanbe Kid is doing, and, and really cool to see how much like hardcore like specific stuff that y'all are doing. Um, I think a lot of you know diehard fans have been like itching for you know you guys to be playing more fests and things like that in the hardcore world. So that's been really cool to see. Um, Chase, again, thank you for coming on the podcast, and you know. I'm bummed that I didn't get to see you at Northern Lions, but you know, I'm I'm sure our paths will cross once again really, really soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Spencer. Appreciate it, man. <laughs>